has is Postgres demystify, or it could also be how uh, Postgress puts in the box. So you know, I'll highlight a quick tour of um, a lot of really cool features um, and hopefully some useful things. So I'm going to cover a lot of different things in here. Um, first, a little bit of background. I work at Heroku, uh, specifically uh, Heroku Postgres. Uh, so we, in addition to running the platform as a service, run Postgres as a service um, with the largest fleet of Postgres databases in the world. Um, we've said that quite a few times publicly and no one's refuted it, so we're pretty confident in it. Um, and in case anyone's interested, we are hiring, so if you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, if you like Postgres, if you like web applications, if you like running hundreds of thousands of databases, uh, come chat. Um, also, a really quick shout out if you're on a Mac, don't use Brew, don't use Mac ports, use Postgres.app. I'm actually running it right now. Uh, it sits in your dock, it's really native, natural to a Mac, uh, and works really well. So for a, kind of a brief agenda of what I'm going to cover, and within each of these there's going to be a good bit of different stuff. Um, a really quick history kind of a Postgres, which there will be a little bit of a recap this morning from Christoph. Um, some things that when you're actually developing with Postgres, when you're actively you know, starting from the ground up, understanding some of your performance stuff as an end user, um, and then some tools for, for querying. So once you have data, it's useful to kind of get something out of it. So it's a really quick history. It came out of Ingress, uh, hence the name Postgres, or PostgresQL, not PostgreSQL, as so many people will commonly say. Uh, it's been around since the early 90s, depending on when you count it. Um, and as Christoph talked about this morning, it's community driven, community owned. So there can be well, no one owner, which is a really important thing. I think everyone here is probably a fan of Postgres, but when talking to others, it's an important uh, characteristic to point out. Um, Christoph talked a good bit about this in BCC. It's really awesome. Essentially, each query sees what was committed before it. Um, it reduces logging overall. Uh, so why Postgres? Um, as a colleague said, it's the Emacs of databases. Now, I'm actually a VI user, or that I am an Emacs user, but the idea is that it's, it is kind of like an operating system. There's a lot of things you can build on top of it. Um, it's a great baseline. For a long time, it's had this history of being really reliable with your data, not losing it. Um, in the last five years, we've seen a lot more features come into it to make it a much more user-friendly data. So it's a ways to go in some areas. There's still some rough edges, but overall, it's much more powerful now. All right, so diving right into developing with Postgres. Um, first off, P SQL is your friend. Uh, Christoph mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to highlight it a bit. So I'm just actually going to hop in here and do a few things. Um, how many people here use P SQL regularly? How many people use something else? Okay, so hopefully I can convince those to use something else and spend a little more time here. Um, so really quickly, I'm just going to do slash ec2 to describe all my tables. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, simple. Um, from here, I can describe a specific table. So I can say, describe my product table and see what it looks like. So I get my schema pretty quickly. Uh, slash x, and there's actually a better format, uh, or better command in Postgres 9.2, which will auto-format your output. But what this does is expand so it shows my, uh, my record in a very fashion. So I'm just going to go ahead and query something here. Um, and PSQL will have tab completion as well, which is quite nice for, for those of you who have to So I'm just going to query one of these. And if we see that record pretty nicely displayed there for you to see. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. Um, and then for those that don't want to type all their SQL in here regularly, that you have a default editor set up, um, if you do backslash e, <coughs> Um, it will open up in your default editor. So for me, this is VI. I can come in here and edit this. And if I save and exit, it will then run this for me. So you don't actually have to edit right there in PSQL. You can set up your default editor, whether it's Emacs or VI or something else, and edit it right there. So PSQL has a lot of other um, various things like that, I'd say um, embrace it. Um, if you do backslash uh, question mark, I believe, it'll show you all the commands. There's a lot of useful ones. These are probably the ones I use most. Um, but if you start to use them, you can really get a lot more uh, mileage out of it. 
So data types. Crystal mentioned this at the very, very, very start of the morning, but didn't dive in, which I'm glad he didn't, so I had something to talk about. Um, Postgres has support for a lot of data types, starting with numeric types from you know any kind of number you can want. Uh, to IP types, so IP addresses, MAC addresses, uh, shapes. So even without PostGIS, we've got basic shapes and we can um, use certain extensions later with some of these shapes. Um, to point out one actually really awesome one that is kind of fun, most likely underused, is actually uh, right here, it's an array. Uh, so what I've got is a uh, I've got my items table, or my products table. I've got a name for it, and I've got tags for it. And these tags could be anything. Think of a, a blog. You've got a category tags. Um, in some cases, you know, normalization is great. In some cases, you don't necessarily need to have another table for my, my categories or for my database. Um, it's just bloat, especially when, you know, it's always going to be on this one record. So then what I can do is, you know, create a table like this. And insert into it just like that, just like that, uh, without having to join to another table. Then it's immediately available. But I can also use this as a condition. I can say, you know, where this array contains this value. So I can query on it just like I would in the other way. Uh, a few data types that people don't use too often, but really should: um, timestamp with the time zone. Um, if you're dealing with time zones at all, they're a complete nightmare. Let Postgres do that for you. Um, same thing with times. Uh, UUID and Boolean. Boolean's a pretty simple one. UUID I don't see many people using, uh, but it's really, really great for actually using unique identifiers. Uh, Postgres, you know, optimizes it pretty well. Um, there's a function you can use to generate one. Um, if you're using anything where you're trying to create a UUID for a user, uh, definitely go ahead and use the data type so you get the benefits there. Um, a few others that I can see, you know, if people want to get creative and create their own types, Postgres is really friendly to accepting new types. Uh, I'll talk about a few other recent ones um, in a minute. Uh, but email, phone number, zip code, URL, any of these kinds um, can be really great so you can get extra functionality around them. Um, they're not there today, but they can easily be added. So in addition to all of the basic types, um, you can get extra types with extensions. How many people here have used Postgres extensions before? Okay. Um, so Postgres extensions have a variety of different functionality. They, a lot of them ship with Postgres, uh, but they don't come default installed, so you have to enable them. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, to highlight a few on, on the data type front, there's uh, HStore uh, case insensitive text, um, ISN, uh, <coughs> Cube, uh, Ltree, and we've got other extensions that do other things. So jumping right into one of these, this is probably my favorite extension that exists. Um, we use it really heavily at Roku for internal stuff. Um, we're really excited about it. Um, is HStore. Uh, so what I do actually, uh, I'll jump ahead for just a minute, is I say, uh, <coughs> Yeah, create an extension in HTML right there at the top, uh, which enables the extension. It's just like the data type thing. So in the same way that I can have a bar char or a integer, I can say HTML. And what HTML is is a key value store. So not a full JSON nested document, um, but a dictionary that I can put directly into my column. I don't have to define anything ahead of time, so it looks something like this. So there I can say, you know, sex is male, state is California, and I can add something entirely new. I've not defined any of that structure. I just said, this is an H store, and I can put anything I want in here. Then I can query where it exists or where it doesn't exist. Um, we can actually go ahead and query some right now. So let's see. So let me grab a few users. So I think you can see in here I've got um, where sex is female, where state is Washington. So I can put that right into my condition. So it's got this uh, little notation like this in, in Postgres 9.1, and it's changed slightly in 9.2, um, and now I'm only going to get back females. So when you need that little bit of schemaless, um, you don't have to necessarily go to something completely else, Postgres can do that for you, and then guarantee that it's actually going to keep your data safe as well. Um, 
So one really exciting thing about Postgres time two was JSON support. So HStore is great for quick, light, schemaless, uh, but it's not a full document. It's, you can't nest, it's not full JSON. Um, Postgres is 9.2 added JSON support. Um, and when it first came out, it's great, it works. Um, there's not anything too special about it. Where it gets really powerful um, is with V8. How many people here run Chrome? Google Chrome? Only a handful. Okay. Um, V8's the JavaScript engine inside Chrome. It's the JavaScript engine, I believe, inside Safari as well, inside most web browsers. It's a really fast JavaScript engine. Um, and PLV8 is actually embedding that V8 engine inside Postgres. So then you can do fun things like this. And if you don't understand what's going on right there, uh, it's executing any JavaScript I send into it. So now we don't have to worry about SQL injection attacks, but we have to worry about JavaScript injection attacks too. So we don't do things like this. This is a really bad idea. But we can do really powerful things and basically execute um, JavaScript when it's well contained within our database uh, and validate JSON that way and parse it quite efficiently now in Postgres 9.2. Uh, going along with the, the 9.2 theme, uh, and more data types, uh, range types is a new one that's quite powerful. Uh, so a range is essentially a range of a from and to anything. So this can be time ranges, this can be alphabetic ranges, uh, numeric ranges. In this case, I've got uh, a little database for a conference where I've got uh, a room and I've got talks. Um, so you know, I've got this talk that's occurring on this date, from 1 p.m. <coughs> to 1 p.m. And what I can actually then do is create an exclusion constraint that says no, no talk can overlap in the same room. So as soon as I try to insert a talk that starts too early, it will automatically know about that. So if you think about scheduling applications traditionally in Postgres, you've got to do a lot of checking for you know, when a class fills up and that kind of thing. And this will automatically take care of it for you. Uh, in addition, there's full text search, uh, which you can get a couple of extra things. So uh, TS vector and TS query, um, so for text data and then for the search predicates. Uh, if you're doing anything where you need to search text, full text search in Postgres is, is pretty powerful and has some specialized indexes and operators. Um, and I mentioned before about shapes. Uh, if you're doing geospatial things, uh, post just really is the way to go. Uh, so you get new data types, you get 2D and 3D boxes so you can actually model geography correctly. Uh, then you get new operators, so you can say, you know, where's this point is in this box, or this box, uh, what's the closest two points from two boxes, those kind of things. And then you can understand, you know, that relationship and that distance. Uh, it is pretty CPU intensive, unlike most of Postgres, but uh, if you're doing geospatial stuff, it's, it's great and you can, it can be an entire other talk that you can dive into. Alright, so that's kind of the, the developing arena. I'd say if you're not using some of the great data types, try to start using them. They're really powerful, they're really great. Each story, anytime you want some flexibility and agility, it's a really, really wonderful one. Um, and I'll come back to some tips for using it in a, in a minute. Uh, so on performance. Sequential scans. They're, they're bad most of the time. This isn't always the case. Sometimes when it's doing a sequential scan, Postgres is actually smarter than you are. Uh, I've spent hours before looking at queries thinking it's not doing what it's supposed to, when in reality, it just knew the data better than I did. And indexes are good, but also most of the time. You don't want an index on all your data, uh, as Christoph was talking about. So on, uh, on the types of indexes a little bit. There's support for a variety. I'm um, just going to talk about the top three of these. Um, KNN is, is for traversing uh, similarity and uh, space partition and disk. I don't fully understand, and it's been explained to me several times over. Um, I know, you know there's a great use case for it, um, but I think the pretty narrow use case right now. Uh, so B tree, this is the default one. This is what you usually want when you say create index. This is what you're going to get. In most cases, this is completely fine. Um, it's what you usually want. Don't think too much on it. Uh, 
uh, gen index, uh, generalized converted index. Um, there's a couple of clear cases when you want to use this. Um, when you have multiple values in one column, so think of when you're using an array or h sort. So when you're using h sort, make sure you take advantage of a gen index. So you can actually then index on keys inside your h sort. So if you want to have all sorts of things in there, if you want to have sets and state and zip code, you may not want to index on all those things. You can index on zip code where only it exists. And then generalized search index. Um, so this is really for full text search, um, for shapes, for that kind of thing. So if you're doing anything there, just indexes are the ones you want. So uh, given a, a query right here, a really basic query, um, you can use uh, Postgres Explain to, to see what it's doing. Um, right here, this will this is what it explains <coughs> for now, and it's going to show a few things. Um, this is really all you need to uh, to understand for an explain plan. Um, you need to know the the start cost, the max time, the rows return, and what you're going to see is that sequential scan on the left. Um, most of the time, it's helpful to run an explain analyze as well. Uh, if you're not worried about it bringing down your database, um, if you're worried about it bringing down your database, uh, hopefully you weren't running it to begin with because it was probably doing some pretty bad things. Um, so what we can actually see here um, on the explain analyze is what it actually did as well as what it thought it would do. So on the first set of numbers, we've got the, the data from the explain. Um, and on the lower set of number, we've got the, how long it actually took. Um, and then we've got the total runtime down here as well. So this took 295 milliseconds. Uh, I'd say a rough rule of thumb is most queries, when it, except for when you're doing analytics, you're going to want for 10 milliseconds or less. It's going to be, want to be pretty quick in most cases. Um, and a large rule of thumb, um, actually I'll talk about that in just a moment. So uh, given this, we can see you know this query is taking quite a while. Um, pretty straightforward uh, query. We can add the index and, and trim it down to see you know now it's using the index scan like we want. Uh, it's now running at 1.7 milliseconds. But how do we get to this point? Um, a few more things actually on on creating index itself. Uh, if you don't today. Please use create indexing concurrently. Um, there's almost not a case where you don't want it. Uh, what it'll do is when you create an index, it takes a lot on your table, and you essentially can't write your data. Create index concurrently is roughly on the order of two to three times slower. Uh, it can be worse, it can be better, but it'll create that index in the background. So you can still add data while it's adding and creating the index. Um, also, you can do conditional indexes. So if you want to index only a part of your data, uh, a good example of this would be a, a phone book. Uh, people live at a lot of different addresses. If you keep all that forever, you don't need it. You only need where they're, they're currently living. So you could say, uh, create index on address where current equals true. And it would only index such, such things. Um, queries like that are, are bad um, because they can't use the index. Um, when you start off with a wildcard, um, when you start off with something like that, it actually can use the index. So just keep that in mind when you're querying data. There's also a few extensions that help with this. Um, so extensions cover a variety of things. Um, so I mentioned the data types. There's also two uh, that give some stats around your rows and uh, around row blocks as well. Um, so if you really want to enter insight, you can dig it there. So like I was saying, uh, that's great once you know there's a problem with the query, but, but how do you know how your database is doing from afar? How do you know at a really high level is it doing well, is it doing bad, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so don't worry about copying this down. All the slides are online, so you can grab this and, and just run it yourself. Uh, I'm actually going to run it locally. <coughs> um, and what I have there is my index hit rate and my cache hit rate. So most applications follow the rule where 20% of your data is accessed 80% of the time. And it's actually probably more than that. You've got a lot of data sitting around you never touch, and you've got a lot of data you access very frequently. 
Uh, Postgres's planner is actually very, very smart about keeping the data you access frequently in memory. You don't have to worry about that. It's going to do it for you. Um, but what you want typically is, you know, on most applications, I would say enough memory so that about that 20% of your data fits into memory so it's accessed quickly. Um, what this will show you right here is how often that memory, that data was in cache versus how often it had to go to disk. So in this case, I'm actually doing really, really poorly. Um, fortunately, this is my local machine. It's a dev environment, so it's not super surprising. Um, <clears throat> but what you want to see is a caching rate of about 0.99 or 99% or higher. Um, index rate, maybe not quite as much, but similarly, you want it to be about that 99%. It means, you know, 99% of the time, I'm hitting data that's in cache, it's in memory, it's fast. If it's not, try adding indexes or um, adding memory to your box, so going to a bigger machine. Uh, so similarly, uh, there's the index hit rate. So, Christoph mentioned earlier this morning, you know, starting with links like having no indexes is actually perfectly fine. But at some point, you're going to have a lot of data, and when you have a lot of data, indexes are pretty helpful. Uh, this query, if you want it, will give you something like this. So this will show the table name, the percent that the index was used, and then how many rows are in the table. So as a rough, 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 rough rule of thumb, I'd say anything with 10,000 rows or more, you may want to add an index on. Um, and you, when you do have the index, you definitely want to see that percent of times index used, probably at 90%, uh, maybe up to 99%. So I've got one table that has an index that's actually adding value. I would say, you know, any of these tables right there, I wouldn't worry about them. The rest, you definitely add some indexes. Um, this is actually a real live example of something. We shipped out at Heroku. We didn't have any indexes. We came in here. We added them in about five minutes uh, and shaved about a second off request time per user. Uh, another great thing in, in Postgres 9.2, is PG stat statements. Um, so in Postgres 9.2, what it does is, if I said uh, select star from users where email equals pregnantheroku.com, um, it's going to take that and essentially genericize it so that it you know, looks like it was a parameter. It's going to keep track of how many times the square was run, uh, how long it took, um, and all of these things about you know, how many blocks were dirty, how many were written, all these things that are pretty useful. Um, from here, what you can actually do is, is boil this up. So if you query raw stat statements, you're going to get a lot of stuff. Um, you can boil this up to something a little bit more like this, where you can see this was called, this query was called 3,000 times, the total amount of time, the rows, and the hit percent. So based on this, actually, in, in 9.2 and up, this will tell you right away where you need to add indexes. How many times are you running this query? Uh, how long is it taking? What do you need to do with it? So on to, to query. Any questions on the first two parts? Uh, all right. So window functions. Window functions are a great little tool when you need them. I'd say you know by default a lot of applications may not. Uh, but if you're starting to do things like cohort analysis and grouping things, uh, it can become quite useful. So in this case, I've got uh, biggest spender by state. Um, if I wanted to, to calculate that, I could pull all this data up into you know, Ruby or Python or Java uh, or .NET, or I could write some PLPG SQL, um, or I could write a, a window function. So what this will do is, um, using that rank over, this is going to group all my users by date, and then for each user in that given state, it's going to, to rank them, and that's basically going to compute how much they purchased. So I'm just going to hop back over here and run this again. It'll make a little bit more sense when you see it. <coughs> so what I've got is for my Florida, I've got the person that has the number one rank. For Georgia, the number one. Um, but if you see kind of actually in New York, we've got seven customers and we have them ranked. 
So in this case, maybe I want to take my top customer in every state and send them a coupon. Um, so we can do things like that. So we can filter out the rank in that kind of thing. Um, you've also got some extensions that are helpful when you're querying data and creating reports. A uh, really fun one, actually, is uh, fuzzy string matching. So if you want a really, really lightweight kind of spell check um, or auto-suggest tool, uh, what I can do here is run this, and it'll say, uh, give me the sound X rating for Craig and give me the sound X rating for Will, and then give me the difference between the two of those. So the difference is one. If I run something that uh, is more similar, something. 
And so I've got this top query up there, uh, which is going to give me my top five products by purchases. So take the number of purchases, find the top five, pretty straightforward. But then from there, I want to go back out and get all the users that bought this item. Um, so I could do this with a lot of different joints in a single query, or I could essentially create uh, the CTE up top um, using width. So if you say with this name, it's just like a table at that point the rest of the rest of the way. And you can have multiple lines. So you can get some better composability and readability when you're creating uh, queries that have five, ten joins, that kind of thing. And then you just reference it down at the bottom. Uh, and you can read this, use this in multiple ways. You can use CTEs within other CTEs if you need as well, and easily build on, on your query as you need it.